chapter 12, John chapter 12, and we are continuing to study uh, Jesus' interactions with all sorts of people, and again, the hope is, is that we see as Jesus talks to various types of people, um, we can learn a little bit about what God thinks of unity. Uh, in our in our culture in our society okay uh, so uh, actually I want to focus mostly on John chapter 20 uh, 12 verses 20 through 50 uh, but let's kind of set this up so the beginning of John chapter 12 Jesus in Bethany just outside of Jerusalem it's Passover time lots and lots and lots of people coming to Jerusalem for Passover and Jesus apparently stays with his friends, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, in Bethany, just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And what does uh, Mary do for Jesus at this time? She anoints his feet. With expensive oil. With, yeah. And, and so this theme of Jesus, our king, who's going to die for us, we see this all throughout the Gospels, okay? So Mary, in anointing him, who you anoint a king, mm -hmm. but what was some of the stuff she was anointing him with, his expensive oils? It's kind of the same stuff you might use to anoint not just a king, but also a dead body. And we see this throughout the scripture. Um, Jesus, when, when he was a baby, what did the, uh, what did the wise men bring? Gifts for a king, but also some of that stuff was used to anoint a dead body. It's a theme throughout. Okay? Uh, and then the next story in John chapter 12, Jesus then riding in on a donkey. What prophecy is he uh, fulfilling there? Zechariah 9, your king is going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Okay? Um but also, uh, Genesis 22, we've read Genesis 22, Sacrifice Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, uh, that procession to Mount Moriah, which is, will become Jerusalem later, uh, what was a part of their procession to this place of sacrifice? A donkey was a part of that procession. Genesis 22 has all these similarities to Jesus' life. That's one of them. But we see this constant theme. He's a king, but he's also a king that's going to come die for us. Okay? So I wanted to make sure you understood that introduction before we get into John chapter 12. Okay? All right. So uh, let's go to verse 20 then. And I'm not going to exactly read, but you guys can follow along. So it says, so we're at Passover. Okay. Jews from around the world, so Egypt and from wherever, coming to Jerusalem. But apparently, who else comes to celebrate Passover? Gentiles as well. Very interesting. And here we see some Greeks who are coming to Jesus. Now, again, uh, I, you don't have to read commentaries about all this stuff, but it can be interesting sometimes. Because who are these Greeks that John is referring to? It's funny how these uh, theologians like to argue. Who We spend a lot of time arguing over things like that. Who exactly are these Greeks? Lots of different opinions. I just thought probably the best uh, answer I heard was from this area of the Decapolis. So I'll just go with that answer. Um, and what do they? who do they want to see? They want to see Jesus. Why? Well, what, what has Jesus done that, that's getting him all the, the, the attention? Riding into Jerusalem, huge crowds calling out his name. Wow, who's this guy? Why is there a huge crowd celebrating Jesus at this point? He's done some miracles that's really got a lot of praise. Raising of Lazarus, maybe the Luke 9, giving the blind man sight, those things. Okay, so these Greeks want to know who Jesus is as well. 
And so they go to Philip. Why Philip? What kind of name is Philip? It's not a Jewish name. That's a, that's a Greek name. And so we know that Philip is from Bethsaida. Okay, so there might be some connections there as well. And they want um, Philip to take them to Jesus. So Philip and Andrew are going to take these guys to Jesus. Um, hold your spot in John chapter 12. But let's go to Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49. I think those are two. When I hear Greek, so I don't think location. I think mindset. Okay. The Hellenistic, yeah. And scholar. Mm -hmm. So when Greeks come, it's like, oh, suddenly a whole crop of smart people come to see Jesus. Right. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different popular philosophies, Greek philosophies, um, from the Greeks at this time. What chapter? Uh, so number two, letter C, Isaiah 42, verse 6. The right passage. All right, very good. Uh, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people. We've talked about covenant a lot. And then it says, and a light for the Gentiles. What were the Jews as God's covenant people supposed to do? Be a light not just among themselves but for the world, for the Gentiles as well. And so we see these Greeks coming to Jesus. And then uh, 49, verse 6. Uh, he says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Again, the Messiah, not just for the Jews, but a salvation for all people. And so, wow, isn't this cool? Again, the Christmas story, Jewish shepherds come to Jesus, but also Gentile wise men. Come to Jesus. We see the same thing happening here at the Passover in Jerusalem 30 some years later. And that was all of Jesus' ministry. Where did he go? Not just amongst the Jews, the Jews, but he went to Phoenicia, he was in Decapolis, in Samaria, he went to all these different types of people. Okay, so letter uh, D then, number two, letter D, and then this idea of a king. In ancient cultures, what was the relationship of most kings and the people? I'm the king over here, you're the people over there. You serve me, you die for me, and we stay separated for the most part from one another. And for someone to approach the king, you don't do that unless the king invites you and you've got something to offer the king. Okay, you're a tool of the king, Esther, the story of that, very important here. Okay, so we have Greeks coming to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Um, very unusual thing in that ancient culture. All right, so point number three here. So Jesus has got an audience. This guy who everybody's celebrating, he's our king. This guy's awesome, he's got power. So what does Jesus start talking about next? Starting at verse 23. Starts talking about his death. Wait, what? That's, again, we've talked about this enough with the Jews, right? That they're not looking for a Messiah who's going to be the guy who dies. He's going to be the guy who makes everybody else die. The, the enemies. Uh, in fact, I wrote down I read, uh, last time I led a Bible study, we talked about battles of the Bible. Um, 
Well, I wrote down, uh, we were talking about a lot of the World War movies. One of my favorites is Patton. You guys seen Patton, right? The opening scene. What does he say in that opening scene? Uh, you know, with the big flag behind him, that great scene. He goes, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making some other poor dumb bastard die for his country. That's, that's, that's what people think, right? My king is going to do that. Jesus says the exact opposite to Jews who want the Messiah to be the David type. And now to Greeks, what's their mindset on this kind of stuff? Lots of, di lots of different Greek philosophies at this point. I'm just, uh, I just researched a couple of them. Acts 17 has two Greek philosophies, Epicureanism and Stoicism. So what did Epicurus say about death? Uh, death is the end. When you die, you're dead. Body, soul, everything. There's nothing afterwards. So what did Epicurus say about living right now? Live, have fun. Live to enjoy life. Because you're going to possibly die tomorrow, and then that's it. So get the most out of life today. And, and Epicurus also said, yes, there are gods, like most of the Greeks would believe. But what was the involvement of the gods in our lives? It was nothing. Okay? So they didn't look at gods being involved at all here on earth. They were off playing golf or whatever. Um, Stoicism, uh, they were more of the pantheists of today. You die and you then get reconnected with nature. Okay? Uh, so again, a very different way to look at life. So when Jesus starts talking about death, the Jews are going to be looking at him like, what? The Greeks are going to be looking at him like, what? Really, people are going to struggle to understand. And, and, and actually, when did the disciples really start to get this whole, I'm going to die for you, even though Jesus repeated it over and over again? They didn't get it until... After the, after the resurrection, and even still, they still struggled with it. Okay? It's finally going to be much later. Pentecost starts to make sense a lot more. The Holy Spirit giving them that, that wisdom. So here's where I'm going to tell my story. <laughs> About confusion, even though it's repeated to you over and over again. So you got to bear with me. <laughs> we went out to dinner. We're getting of the age now where our kid, we can leave our kids at home and we don't have to think it'll be great someday. <laughs> you don't even have to think about it. Kids, we're leaving. We'll be back in a couple hours. So we go out to eat and we're out on Blue Mound at the corners. Is that yeah. The corners. And we stop, good parking spot, Bel Air, Cantina. <laughs> We got a half hour wait, that's fine. We'll go walk around. And we go into, you guys been out there? Yeah. Okay. Cafe Hamlet is open. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. And so we go walk around and we go into Bon Mauer. Bon Mauer, Moore. Emma corrected me, I was pronouncing it. <laughs> but we're just walking around, just killing time, just killing time. And we get into the purse <laughs> section. Holy cow, do they have a purse section? So I say to Abby, I can't believe how women are just obsessed with purses. And she goes, just look at some of the prices. I looked at a few of those prices. Now, if we were younger, she would have had a camera right on me. Here's what some guys react to the prices of purses. Holy cow, I was just... Expensive. You could have shown me that day after day. I would have been just as shocked the next day as I was that day about how expensive purses are. Okay? So my con I just don't get it. All right? And then we went to the shoe section. I was going to say, yeah, the shoes are Holy <laughs> moly. Things that, I'm telling you, they look like flip-flops. 
And then in the first, and the yeah, and the flip flop, or the um, uh, they 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 look like slippers. They were slippers. They were slippers. So I I just didn't get it. And then Emma, because I said this to her, and she said to me, it's probably like some people who find out what golf clubs cost. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You could show Emma. Although the golf clubs are cheap. Yeah, all that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the golf clubs I buy. Yeah. Um, but you just over. You can repeat it over and over again, and people just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to their thinking. Okay, Jews and Greeks not understanding Jesus at this point. So he gives a great analogy, uh, number three point B, about a seed. Before the seed can produce something great, what's it got to do? Die. Die. Buried. The skin comes off, the outer coating comes off, and then it can be become something great, something fruitful. So Jesus says, that's what I have to do. Again, is it going to sink into people? Probably not. All right? And then he starts talking about, um, uh, you know, later on in, in uh, chapter 13, washing his disciples' feet. This is what I have to do. I have to serve you. What? No, you're the master. No, this is what I have to do. I have to serve you. It didn't sink in with Peter, right? And then what did Jesus say? You guys have to do the exact same thing. And then you will be blessed for that. Do we think in those terms in our culture, the one who serves is the blessed one? Not a lot of times. We always think, I'm blessed when people serve me, right? And Jesus is totally different on how he looks at life. And then obviously Jesus going to the cross, again, doesn't make sense to people. But that's what he is. That's what he's all about. And then he's exalted. And we will be exalted when we follow that. Okay? So in this confusion, what in the world is this guy talking about? We're at uh, point number four now. Let's look at verse 27 through 34. Jesus says, yeah, this is troublesome. This isn't going to be easy for me. But should I just then not do it because it's difficult? I love that question. Should I just abandon my purpose because I'm going to have to suffer a little bit? He kind of said the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? Basically, his prayer, take this cup from me, but not my will. Okay? He's going to go to the cross. That's his job, even though it's not going to be a pleasant one. He's going to do that. And so to help people understand that what Jesus is saying, even though it's confusing, is the real deal. What came out of heaven? A voice. Okay? And now this is at least the second time a voice has come from heaven. When was the first time? Yeah, yeah at his baptism. Yeah, this is my son. Transfiguration. Oh, the transfiguration. Although this is the first time John mentions a voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other yeah. the transfiguration was so, so we see God interact, the Father interacting, okay? And this is for whose benefit? For the audience. Jesus did that at Lazarus's raising. He said a prayer, but he said it out loud. And he said this is for the audience so that they will know that God is working here. This is for their benefit so that they realize this is the real deal what's going on here. That they can trust that what's happening here is something that's good. It's from God. All right. So the crowd hears this stuff. And they're still questioning. Wait, was that thunder? What was that? No question. You quite get this. And then they start asking a question. And I want you all to go to Daniel. I'm at uh, number 4.C. Go to Daniel chapter 7 now. Because as they're trying to understand, is this guy the Messiah? We think he is. 
But now he starts talking about his death. Is this really what God wants? So Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. People are questioning this. Which most of us probably would question this. Uh, verse 14. Uh, it says... Well, actually, let's start at verse 13. It says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus talked about that. You will see me riding on a cloud. He approached the Ancient of Days, God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him, his dominion, dominion is an everlasting dominion. What were people thinking? Death? No. They're thinking the Messiah, God, all of that lasting. How does death fit into this equation? So they're questioning Jesus. They don't get what he's talking about. They don't understand resurrection. But Jesus continues to talk about the idea of before we can have victory, I've got to go through this death. And so uh, number four point uh, E, victory through death, victory over Satan through death. This is what Jesus is all about. Uh, so let's go back to John chapter 12 if you're not back there. And now we're at verse 35. So what does he say to these people as they're struggling with his teaching? Uh, he doesn't repeat himself over and over and over. He said, he said this quite a few times already to them. Verse 35 and 36, he's, follow me. I've given you all the information you need. I've given you all the signs you need. I'm clearly the light of the world that God promised you. Simply follow me. And when you follow me, then you will become sons of light as well. And the whole world will see the truth through you as you follow me. So let's go to the back side of your sheet number six. So obviously, as people struggle because this doesn't make sense. I was talking with this uh, with one of our teachers. This goes to Bob's uh, Bible study that he did. Some things are simply a what in Scripture, a mystery. It's hard to understand. So I was talking to a teacher about communion, real presence. They're struggling with this. Lifelong Lutheran. We're just struggling with this. So we were reading up on some stuff. The Lutheranism 101 book that we went through a couple years ago, we were going through that. I was like, man, but I just want to, I want to make this logically fit my brain. I said, well, that's going to be a struggle with something like this. Some things are just a mystery that we have to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put our trust and faith in. It may not click mentally like we would like it to okay and so uh verse 36 through 40 yeah a lot of people i'm not gonna believe jesus he doesn't fit my idea of a messiah he doesn't fit my logical thinking of what god should be or do to the enemy and what does john say in verse 36 through 40 even though I've given them what? Even though Jesus has given them what? Many signs. Sign after sign after sign after sign. They're still, I'm not going to believe in him. Well, is this any different for the Jewish people? No, God's always given them signs, right? And what have they always done? One more. Yeah, give me one more. And even still, if it doesn't fit what we like, we're going to reject it. 
Uh, Isaiah dealt with this quite a bit. So let's go back to Isaiah uh, and let's look at chapter 6. So we're at number 6, letter B. Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. I actually, we did a Bible study on this a couple years ago. Difficult teachings of the Bible. This was one of them. And this might have been the most difficult teaching. I really struggled through, through this. It says, he said, go and tell his people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. What is God doing to some of his people? The same as what Pharaoh had to deal with. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Wait a second. What is God allowing to do? to people? Does this make sense to us? Otherwise, they might see with their eyes. That word otherwise. Other versions use the word lest. Lest they. Really difficult teaching. And John is repeating that in John chapter 12 verse uh, 36 through 40. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What does that kind of sound like? God, you've rejected me over and over and over again, and at some point, what is God going to do? We're done. And I, I struggle with that teaching. Because um, that, you know, what's the psalmist say? Um, his mercy endures. You know, how, how do we how do we deal with all of that? Um, so here's kind of the the thing that we kind of came to a conclusion on in that Bible study a few years ago. Um, what does God not want to happen to His flock, His fold? Okay, He doesn't want people coming in and destroying what he has gathered together. Okay? Um, like in football. You, you, you don't want the, the, the opponent to get into your huddle okay, and disrupt what you're doing. Alright? You gotta keep that out. And for that to be something for the Jewish people in many ways, God's chosen Really, really tough teaching here. Um, I didn't write this down, but let's go to Second Peter three verse nine. It's not on your sheet. It's on mine. No, you hand wrote it. On Somebody. I hand wrote it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know what? I'm better than I give my self or else, yeah, there was woo, some something wrote that down. It's a mystery how that got there. Second uh, Peter chapter three verse nine. Verse nine says, "The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness." Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. His mercy does endure, but what does God know? He knows more than us. And so his divine judgment, his perfect righteous judgment knows what is right to do in these cases. So again, we got to give God our complete trust. He knows what he's doing in all things. Okay? All right. Um, so let's go back to John chapter 12. Then. So 
So what, is that, what else does that tell us about God's kingdom? Does, uh, John chapter 12, verse 32, uh, a lot of people like to uh, take that out of context. You know the term universalism, right? Everybody's going to heaven no matter what. Or, I mean, I don't know about Hitler, but everybody's going to heaven no matter what. Verse 32, what do some people say about that verse all by itself? And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Some universalists like to use that to say, yeah, everybody's going to heaven no matter what. But what do we clearly see in the rest of the context of all of this? God wants all people to him. Jesus has been offered for all people, okay? But the sad fact is what? Some people are going to what? Reject, Reject that, walk away from that. All right, uh, so let's go to point seven then. Uh, so uh, John chapter 12, starting in verse 42. And I'll read this. Yet at the, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Pharisees and priests, some of these people. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear. They would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Woo! Does that talk about our culture today? I'll be a clear, bold witness in this nice, safe place. But out there, zip it, because I don't want to be accused of anything, right? And that's what these guys are worried about. You could be kicked out of the synagogue for following Jesus. We talked about that last week with, with John chapter 9. What happened to the blind man? Because he wouldn't change his story. He was out of there. He, and, and when you're kicked out of the synagogue, it's not just you can't go to church like we go to church. You're basically chastised by the whole community. Remember, religion was everything. Okay, so every part of your life was going to be negatively affected by this. This was, yeah, probably something like that. The Amish community, you're gone, you're done. Okay, and so they don't want to lose either their status within society or their comfort within society. And so everybody just, and what's happening to the Christian church, a lot of things with things that are going along today. People are, I, I, I think our Lutheran church over the last, gosh, 15 years has been a lot more vocal. Washington, D.C. and so forth. Okay? You don't want to be accused of not speaking the truth in public. Really important here. But that is our tendency, right? I don't like conflict. I don't want to deal with all this. So I'll just be quiet. Um... But what does Romans 10 clearly say? Yeah. If you can confess your faith publicly, you're good. But sometimes that's going to be difficult. Sometimes that's going to be a struggle. What did Jesus say? Should I not do my purpose because it's going to create trouble? Well, that's you and I as well. Should I not speak the truth in love and respect? Because it's going to be difficult. No, we can't do that. We have to continue to say the truth, no matter the consequence. But they'll take you off of Facebook. <laughs> Which, for me, not a big deal. <laughs> but yes, that is true. Okay. Don't say and, certain words. And, and, and we struggle with that in every part of our life. I always say, I've said this many times, I've actually got one of the luckier jobs in the world. Because my job is to speak the truth 
but many people in many jobs. We, we talked about that term, um, not freedom of religion, but freedom of worship. That was that that became popular about 12, 13 years ago. You have the freedom to worship there or at your home, but at the workplace, out in public, zip it. Keep it to yourself. And so there's a lot of pressure not to be bold in your witness uh, to our communities. Yeah. All right. So um, so then point number eight. Um, John just kind of gives a summary now. So starting at verse 46, he kind of gives a summary of Jesus's, his whole mission, his whole purpose, his whole ministry uh, at the end of this. But what is his clear point? This ministry is to who? To all people, Jew and Gentile. Okay, so let's uh, follow along as I read, starting at verse 46. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Catch that. Who believes. Okay. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. John 3, 17, right? He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. I'm just going to share the truth. Do my job. Holy Spirit is going to do its work to help you believe. Verse 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that this that his commands leads to eternal life. That's where that crowd, I don't get how death, why would you die? Well, yeah, because death then is going to lead to something. Jesus' death is going to lead to something greater, eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And so that great message, that summary of Jesus' uh, ministry for Jew, for Gentile, for all the world. So um, turn in your Bibles now to, uh, so we're going to go on to point number nine. Go to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. You guys know what a caste system is. You're born in this position, the status in society. That's it for you. Can't move up, can't move down, doesn't matter. And the Jewish temple was kind of like that. You had God in the holiest area, correct? Who could go there once a year? The high priest, so he's got pretty good status, close to God. Who could go into a holy area to make sacrifices and so forth? The priest, so he's pretty close to God. Jewish men who brought the sacrifices and whatever else uh, to the priest on behalf of their family. They were pretty close to God. Jewish women, pretty close to God. But now we start getting further away. The Gentile court, out away from God. Not as close. Okay? And then, who, who would the others be? Non-believers, tax collectors, uh, where would the lepers be? They're, they're not even in the city. They're, they're way, where would the Samaritans be? They're, they're, in their, they're at their own mountain to worship. They're way out of the picture. Okay? In fact, it was offensive to allow anybody else into these holy areas. You don't allow that to happen. Okay, so Ephesians. Oh, I didn't go to Ephesians. Chapter 2, starting at verse 13. What did Jesus do for people? 
but now, I love that, okay? So before, but now, there was people are bad, people are bad, people should not be next to God, people should be separated from God, all that kind of stuff. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, Gentiles, all these other people, who were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All these people, even those tax collectors, really? Really, those people too? For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one. Who are the two groups? Jews and Gentiles. And has destroyed the barrier. Jews over there. Gentiles over there. The dividing wall of hostility. What did we say about Samaritans and Jews? Woo! Talk about hostility, right? By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away. Jesus didn't just preach to the Jews, right? He went all over the place. And peace to those who were near, the Jews as well. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You are all welcome into God's house. And what did Jesus call himself? The temple. You're welcome into that temple, into Jesus. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Isn't that beautiful, what Christ Jesus has done? So let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Starting at verse 28. <laughs> You guys know this verse. This is pretty, pretty common. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, and there's the if, right? If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. What is... Paul saying here, if you are in Christ, that's a true child of Abraham, a true descendant of Abraham. Um, John chapter 8 says that Abraham saw Christ. Isaiah, uh, in, in John chapter 8, Isaiah saw Christ. They understood what the Messiah was all about. The true descendants of these men are the people who have that same belief in Christ and heirs according to the promise. Do you believe in the promise that God was going to save his people from sin through Christ? Abraham understood it. Isaiah understood it. Even Gentiles, like that Samaritan woman, understood it and that's where people are united clearly and truly in that any questions any thoughts 
I was going to laugh. <laughs> so the blind man would have been down there with the others. Because his sin made him a great sinner, so he's at the gate of the city begging. And now that he professed Jesus, he's back out. Even though he's got his sight back out, you're back out there again. Even though you have your sight. Okay, very good. Let's uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, thank you, Lord, for helping us understand that it's through you we have peace. It's through you that we come to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to not be separated by the things of this world. Satan certainly wants us to be divided on so many different issues. But help us to know where true unity comes from. It is from you and you only. In your name we pray. Amen.